Well, good morning, New Life. If you're visiting with us, we want to thank you for worshiping with us. Uh, please stick around if you're able to. We'd love to get to know you and uh, hopefully for you to get to know us a little bit better. Uh, we are actually finishing up our series on parables of the kingdom. And next week, we'll begin a new series for about six weeks or so on Psalms for the Summer. But if you have your Bibles with me, open up to the Gospel of Luke. We're going to take a look at arguably one of the, the most famous parable of all, the parable of the prodigal son. Uh, Luke chapter 15, I'm going to start reading from verse 11 to verse 32. Luke chapter 15, verse 11 to verse 32. And if you're able, if I could ask you to please stand for the reading of God's word. And I pray that you would open up your hearts and minds to receive what the Lord may have to say to us here this morning. Starting with verse 11, this is the word of God. And he said, there was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all that he had and took a journey into a far country, and there he squandered his property in reckless living. And we had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him into the fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against you. I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe. And put it on him, and put a ring on his hand, and shoes on his feet. And bring the fattened calf, and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this, my son, for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of his servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and your father has killed a fattened calf, because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, Look, these many years I have served you, and I have never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed a fattened calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. This is the reading of the word. Please be seated. So we've been looking at various parables throughout the Gospels, and one of the reasons we've done this, as I've said time and time again, is because the parables may be the most effective way, the most poetic and profound, powerful way to help people to understand what is the nature of the kingdom of God like. Because the kingdom of God is such a sort of esoteric, abstract sort of concept, but practically, what does it look like to be part of the kingdom? And how do you get into the kingdom? And what does it mean to be part of the kingdom of God? And so we've been looking at every parable to hopefully illustrate that point. And today, this morning, we come to the parable of the prodigal son. And in some ways, many scholars almost unanimously will say, this is the most famous, the richest, the most detailed, and the most profound of all the parables that are available to us in the Gospels. And so as we look at this, I want to consider a couple of things, that when we look at the parable of the prodigal son, what this parable shows us essentially at the end of the day is the very grace and mercy and the very heart of God for you. No matter what we do and consider here and all the wonderful details of this parable, I think it's written to show that God's heart is full of love and grace and mercy and he longs for sinners to be saved. And that's what this parable is essentially trying to tell us. That's central to what Jesus is trying to show the Pharisees according to verse 2 in the beginning of the chapter. Now, this parable shows us how God accepts and treats different sinners, but it's properly and more popularly called the parable of the prodigal son, and that's okay, but it focuses most of the attention to the younger son. That's why some scholars actually have called this 
This is the parable of the gracious father. And others have actually called this, this is the parable of a father and his two different sons. And the scholar Daryl Bach actually says that might be the best description. But what I want to say here in the beginning is that even though we think about the prodigal son, the younger son, this parable is just as much, if not actually even more, about the older son. And so these two sons, as we'll look at this parable, we'll consider and see these two sons are equally alienated from God, that these two sons show different heart postures, that they're both equally sinful, and are both just as much in need of the grace and love of Jesus. And in some ways, in all of this, we'll be able to see that in these two sons, we'll get a picture of our own lives and heart issues and idolatries and sins. That at least for both brothers, both sons, at least one of them, if not both, you'll be able to see a little bit about your own sort of heart posture and sins and potential idolatries. And then you'll see how in the love of Jesus, God's heart of mercy covers all your brokenness so that you can enter into this very kingdom. That's what we'll consider. This is a powerful way to remind us of the gracious love and mercy of the Father's heart. So this morning, as we look at these three people in the parable, I just want to look at their heart postures, and this is what I want to consider. First, we'll look at the younger son's selfish heart. Secondly, we'll look at the father's loving, merciful heart. And then third, we'll look at the older son's self-righteous heart. So the younger son, selfish heart, the, old, the father's loving, merciful heart, and then third, we'll consider, lastly, the older son's self-righteous, critical, pharisaical heart. So let's take a look at this and see what the passage unveils for us here this morning. So the younger son's selfish heart. In verse 12, just kind of recapping the story, the younger son goes to the father and says this, Give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. In other words, the younger son comes to the dad and he says, I want my inheritance now. Can you give me what's coming to me? And in that culture back then, property wasn't divided. The estate wasn't divided until the dad actually passed away. And so essentially the son is asking, Dad, I want you to be dead because I want your things more than I want you. And even when it says in that verse 12, he divided his property between them, that word there for property literally means his life. He divided his life between his sons. The younger son basically says, give me your life and give me my property. He's asking for the portion of the father's life that the father will give him. He's saying essentially, I can't wait any longer for you to be dead. I want my stuff now. He doesn't want the father, friends, but he actually wants the father's things. And so he takes it in verse 13, he squanders it all, he sells it, and then he lives recklessly and gives it all away. Reckless there means to live without thinking, mindless living, licentious living. And this is essentially, friends, a picture of consummate selfishness. This is a picture of idolatry at the height of its power. You know, he doesn't want the father, he wants the world. Someone who's not in his right mind and he thinks that the key to happiness is to live out the desires of the flesh and the passions of the now. This is the type of person who thinks the key to life is basically personal choice and self-discovery, how many of us actually think today. We want to live autonomously. We want to make our own decisions. We want to experience the world. We think the key to happiness is not going to be something that's so institutional like the church, but to make our individual private choices and to discover the extent of the passions of our heart and to indulge in the desires of the now. This is essentially what the younger brother, younger son represents to us. In other words, friends, this is what more commonly people kind of call this wanderlust, that you just are always a restless soul. You want to explore the world out there. You know, wanderlust comes from basically two words, wander, like it sounds, you want to wander around, comes from the word hike, and lust, which means you have an over-desire, an insatiable craving, an over-desire in your heart to be satisfied and fulfilled and to find a sense of joy, and you think that the world can actually give you this. The younger son shows us the height of arrogance. He shows us the height of autonomy. And what the younger son also shows us is that this way of life always leads to disappointment and destruction. And that's why he thinks it will satisfy him and bring him happiness, but actually what it shows us here in these verses is that it brings him sorrow and despair. He wastes all his money, his famine comes, and he begins to work in the fields. He feeds the pigs in verse 15. And for a Jewish man to be feeding pigs, this was the lowest of the low. Because pigs, according to Jewish law, were ceremonially unclean. This was the lowest of the low to be eating and to be in the mud 
and to be feeding the pigs, friends. There's even a rabbinic saying that says this, Cursed be the man who would breed swine. But even then, the younger son was jealous of what the pig had to eat. And so in verse 17, what we see here is really the beginning of the work of God because verse 17 says, he came to himself. That in our English idiom basically means he came to his senses. And in Jewish wording and thought, that Hebrew idiom basically means he begins to repent. He began to think things more clearly. Verse 18, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. That's what his heart says now, what he wants to say. Heaven basically means God, and you see that the younger son, he begins to repent and says, I repent and I sinned against first God and also then to my father. And he begins to see this. This is the difference, friends. The younger son begins to repent and comes to his senses, and this is why. He didn't repent because he broke the boss's rule. He begins to repent because he realizes that he broke the father's heart. He began to see that the key to happiness is not through personal choice and discovery, but actually to have the Father himself. Not to have the Father sings, but to dwell in the Father's house. So much so that he's willing to reduce his status and say, I'm willing just to be a hired servant as long as I'm a hired servant in the Father's house. And this leads us to the second point. We see the son's licentious, selfish heart, but now we see the Father's loving, merciful heart. Here, friends, we see the clearest picture of the Father's heart for His Son. It's a powerful picture of the grace of Jesus for us. Verse 20 shows us the Father's heart, and this is what it says. But while He was still a long way off, His Father saw Him and felt compassion, and ran and embraced Him and kissed Him. The younger son goes back, and verse 20 says, The Father is looking out in the distance, waiting for Him. He had compassion. You know, he ran and he embraced them and he kissed them. Compassion has this word that means deep emotion. It means your guts all kind of splattered out there. Your insides are turned inside out. And he ran to his son. And a Middle Eastern father would never actually run in public. And he went and he kissed his son repeatedly and tenderly. Now, the idea of this in some ways is basically for those of us who eventually will send off our children to college and you long for them and you miss them. And finally, your child comes back from college, and you're waiting for your child to come back. And you can't wait to pick up your child at the airport. And then you bring him home, and then you give him the best meal that you can cook, and you do all his laundry, and you clean up his room. That's basically what this dad has. It's like a son that goes off to war, and the war is finally over, and comes back. The parent is eagerly waiting for the son to come back. That's the father's heart there. He's not cold and distant, friends. He's eagerly waiting. He accepts his lost son, a sinner coming to God. And that's basically what the father shows us. He's looking out for his son from far away. He runs to him. Blomberg says, the scholar, Middle Eastern fathers would never do this because for a Middle Eastern father to go out and run into the fields to meet the son, it meant that he would have to pick up his skirt and his clothes. That means it reveals his ankles and his feet as he's running out there to meet his son. In that culture, that was one of the most shameful acts that you could do. It was embarrassing. You never reveal that sort of part of your body on the feet and the calves of your legs. You actually never do this. You never run out because it wasn't respectful. The son comes to you. The father doesn't go out to the son. But that shows us the father's heart for people who are seeking forgiveness in him. Verse 22, he brings the best robe, puts a ring on his finger, gives him shoes. It shows the overflowing grace and riches that the father shows his son. The son doesn't deserve any of this. He was hoping to be a servant, but the father treats him like a son. The father completely and utterly transformed the position of the son. Verse 24, for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and now he's found. The robe is a long flowing garment, and it's the same word used in Mark 16.5 to talk about the angels. The ring was a sign of position and authority and marked him as part of the family. It might even convey a sense of authority. The shoes were a sign of wealth and marked him as a free man. Essentially, this younger son went from destitution to restoration, went from poverty to riches in the kingdom of God. The younger son was poor and starving and a servant for pigs, but now he's a beloved son, fully accepted and given full access to the father dwelling in full access in the Father's house. That is the message in the Father's heart to give you full access to himself, which is the greatest treasure that he could ever give us.
A professor once was telling a story in which he was lecturing in a big auditorium with hundreds of people watching and listening to his lecture. And in the middle of his lecture, one of his younger daughters walks through the door and begins to walk up stage because she sees daddy up there giving a lecture and walks right over to the podium where her daddy was, walks up to him and just gives him a big, tight hug on his leg. And then she stops, and the little daughter just walks back down off the stage, and then everyone in the auditorium was laughing. And he took that moment, and this professor says, she is the only one that will have all consistent, constant access to her father. That is what this parable is trying to show us. If your dad is the president of the country, the CEO of the greatest company in the world, you'll have access to him, you'll be able to meet with him in a way that no one else actually has. Now, Tim Keller gives this illustration in various places, but he says this, even if my wife, if she is not sick at 3 a.m. in the morning, she rolls over and wakes up and says, honey, I need a cup of water, I would say to her, go get it yourself. You're my spouse. But if one of my sons comes up, padding up in the middle of the night, one of my little boy comes up and touches me on the shoulder, wakes me up and says, Daddy, I need a cup of water. You get out of bed. Why do you do this? Because he's your child and he always has access to the grace and the love of the Father. The son here in this parable says, I am no longer worthy to be called your son, but treat me as one of your hired servants. But the dad, the father, goes one and above and clothes him in the robe and gives him a ring and shoes, allows him into the house. There's a big celebration. And he says, I'm not going to make you a hired servant. I'm going to reinstate you like a father because you are my son. So begin treating me like a father because no longer do you want the father's things, but you want the father. That is what he shows us. Sinclair Ferguson writes, in this book, Children of the Living God, and he tells the true story of a missionary who adopted a poor young orphan girl. And even though she was adopted, and therefore she was legally in the family, legally she had a father. Legally she was part of the household and family. But relationally, she was so standoffish. And the parents tried, this missionary couple did everything they could to shower her with love and grace because they wanted her to know that you are not just legally our daughter, but you are our daughter and part of our family. But she was always so standoffish until one day, the father was at his desk, and she came up to him with her shoe, and she said this, Daddy, I need a new shoelace. And the dad's heart melted because she was beginning to treat him as a father. And that's what repentance does for us if you're like the younger son. You just want the Father's blessings and his things. You go out in the world and live licentiously. You pursue your careers and your relationships and vacations without any thought about the kingdom. You may have this sort of heart posture as a younger son. And God here is saying, I don't want you to treat me like a boss. I want you to treat me like your daddy. I want you to ask me to tie your shoes. And I want you to come into my house and know that you're always welcomed here. The younger son finally found what he couldn't in the world. He found in the father's house acceptance. He found in the father's house identity, purpose, happiness. In the father's house, he finally found his purpose and his place in his life. What his heart so desperately craved licentiously to find in the world and never found, but it was always failing him, he finally found his heart content in the house of God. He shows us literally what Augustine writes in his book, Confessions. Our hearts are always restless until it finds its rest in thee. Or better yet, I've said this before, everybody knows the movie Chariots of Fire. One of the main characters, Eric Liddell, he's a runner. He says, God built me to be a runner. God made me fast, and when I run, I feel his pleasure. Do you want to feel that? Do you want to sense that purpose, sense that pleasure of God, sense the Father's love for you? He's saying, come back to the house. Don't treat me as a boss, but treat me as your dad. Don't just look for things that I could give you, but look for the grace and relationship that I have with you. That is what this parable is trying to tell us. And friends, this leads us to the third point. You may resonate with the younger son, but many of us may resonate with the older son. We looked at sort of the selfish heart of the younger son, the loving heart of the fathers, of the father, and now we're going to look at the older son's self-righteous heart. And we see this in verses 25 to 32. This is the older brother. We'll see that he's self-righteous, critical, angry, and judgmental. And although there's less verses given to the older son, this may be the stronger point, because I said this before, that in the Gospel of Luke, Luke always wants to identify the audience of the parable. And so in chapter 15, if you look at verse 2, we'll see that the audience of this parable 
are the Pharisees, who are self-righteous, critical, angry, judgmental, like the older son. Verse 2 says this, The Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners, and he eats with them. Table fellowship. That complaint there in verse 2 by the Pharisees is essentially what the older son is complaining about to the father in the parable. Why does a younger brother get a party and a great feast? Why are you eating with them? Why are you eating with him when he squandered all your property? That's the same complaint that the Pharisees have. And when the older brother basically says, you gave him a fattened calf and I don't even get a goat, really what he's saying is this. You give the younger son who ran away a steak at Mastro's and I don't even get a happy meal at McDonald's. What's up with this? And the reason he feels this way is because the older son is self-righteous. No, he thinks the father owes him. He felt that his years of obedience earned him favor, and he thought the father, he earned merited a reward from him. And that's why he's entitled. The language of the older son is slave language. It's employee-type language. Look at verse 29. This is what the the older son says. Look, these many years I have served you. I have never disobeyed your command. A son doesn't talk like that to the father, not one who's actually in a good relationship. They don't say, Dad, I followed all your rules. Dad, I've done every command that you've given me. That's slave-type language. Even that word in verse 29 that says, I have served you, that word there literally means slave. The older son is basically complaining and said, Dad, I slaved all these years for you. You don't even give me a happy meal at McDonald's. You give that younger brat a fine feast, a steak dinner, and I don't get anything. Why? Because the hard posture of the older son is self-righteous, critical, judgmental, angry, resentful, and bitter. You see, friends, this is what the parable is so profound in trying to show us. The parable is saying both the younger and the older sons are equally alienated from God, are equally in need of the grace of Jesus. There are just different sins and heart postures. The younger son is licentious and thinks the key to life is through self-discovery and experience. The older son is a rule follower, is entitled and self-righteous. Both have their sins, but both are equally alienated from God. One lives his life autonomously as a law for himself. The older son uses the law of God as the basis of his acceptance before the father. The only difference is that the younger son comes to his senses and repents, and the older son is still blind to his sin. Friends, this is a profound point. Isn't it ironic towards the end of this parable that the father comes out in verse 28 to plead with the older son that the younger son, who is the outsider, is now the insider celebrating in the house with the feast? And the older son, who remained at home and was the insider, is now the outsider complaining about the younger son, who's the insider. The older son stayed at home, obeyed all the rules. The younger son was the outsider who broke all the rules. And friends, this is the point. The most dangerous thing about this is that there is a reversal of the younger and the older son. And it tells us at least this, that if you're like the older son and you have a self-righteous heart, If you're critical and angry, if you think that you earn God's favor, he owes you a little bit more. If you're like the older son and this picture resonates with you, or maybe it doesn't, what it shows us is that sometimes the hardest thing to know about being older son is the fact that you don't realize you're the older son. Self-righteous people never actually come up to me and confess their sins. As a pastor, people always come up to me and confess various sins. I gossip, I lust. You know, I crave money, I find all these idolatries, I argue, I get angry. I have never in all my years in pastoral ministry had anyone come up to me and say, Pastor Will, please forgive me because I'm self-righteous, because I'm like a Pharisee. Because people are blind to this. Think about it for a moment, friends, when you think about this. What would the younger son look like today in our contemporary modern circumstance? The younger son would probably be someone who's out there in the world, partying it up at the clubs, maybe getting drunk, having promiscuous relationships, doing drugs, living life to the fullest. Where would the older son be in this day and age? He'd be at the prayer meeting. He'd be at church. The older son would be serving on the committees. That's why the older son never realizes that he's just as alienated in his heart. He doesn't realize that both bad deeds alienate from you. He doesn't realize that good deeds as the basis of your acceptance also alienate you from God. That is what the older older son is trying to tell us. And this is how you can tell if if you sort of have these sort of heart tendencies. Older sons tend to be angry. 
Older sons tend to be a little bit self-righteous. They get bitter. They think people are always messing up around them. They're disgruntled and they're entitled. Older sons think that because they're good and they're morally right, they've earned something and they expect something. So friends, if you're like this, if, you, if you're honest here this morning, if you feel that in life, you're always angry at people. You're always disappointed in people. You're always criticizing people. You're always dissatisfied and disgruntled with people in the church and people around you. Then possibly, just maybe, you have this self-righteous sort of heart. The main issue with the older son, friends, is that he knew the rules of the father, but he didn't love the beauty of the father. You understand that? He knew the rules of God, but he didn't see the beauty of God. Now, I shared this before, I think, or maybe it was a, a retreat or whatnot. I don't know anything about classical music, but every morning in my house, almost every morning, I play classical music as my family eats breakfast. And I wish I could learn more about this. And I, thought, I found this interesting when one pastor explained certain different composers, and he said this, the greatest composer is certainly Beethoven. Beethoven is in a class all by himself. And he says Tchaikovsky, Chopin, they're all great. But this is the way this one pastor described Beethoven. He said this, every note that Beethoven wrote that followed the previous note was always the perfect note. That's Beethoven. And when he listens to Beethoven, he can hear and sense the angels singing. That's basically his version of Eric Liddell that says, when I run, I feel God's pleasure. That is the person, in some ways, when you approach God, that is how not only will you just know the rules of the Father, but then you'll begin to sense and see the beauty of the Father. See, if you approach Beethoven as an example, just to get a grade because you have to take music appreciation in college, and so you want to just understand the nuances and notes of Beethoven so you can compare him and contrast him to Chopin, then you know the rules of music, but you'll never sense the presence of music, never sense the beauty of music. And that's essentially the problem of the older son. He followed all the rules. He knew that he was angry. He was disgruntled. He was entitled because he never saw the beauty in the heart of the love of the father's heart. The only thing that was constant, friends, when we look at this, is that the father who represents God in the parable was constantly and consistently gracious and loving to both of his sons. He runs out to embrace the younger son. He throws him in party. He comes out to the older son in verse 28, and he pleads with the older son. Even in verses 31 to 32, all, that word, all the words there that the father gives to the older son, they're very fatherly. They're tender. Verse 31, he says, son, you are always with me. And all that I have, all that is mine is yours. That word there for son is basically a very tender and endearing word. He's like, son, all that I have is yours. The father runs after the younger son. The father pleads after the older son. The only thing consistent within this parable is the grace and the love of the father that pours out to all the sinners who come and seek after him. What we see here, friends, which is pretty remarkable in this passage, and I'm going to get a little theological here before we come to a close. We look at this, and in the context of chapter 15, we've already know, because many of us know this chapter, that before the parable of the prodigal son, there are two other parables. There's a parable of the lost point, and there's a parable of the lost sheep. What I want to offer to you, actually, is to consider that these three parables are actually one parable. You can think about it in three successive stages, or three sort of concentric circles, but there may be just one parable with one theme and one point. Well, how do I know it's one parable? Because back in verse 3, when Jesus tells the Pharisees what he's going to talk about, it says this. He told them this parable. And then he goes into the parable of lost sheep, the lost coin, and then the prodigal son. So when we think about this, this is the beauty of the Bible, friends. Each of these three stages of the different parables, they increase the drama same point, but there's an intensification, there's an escalation of what the main point essentially is. Each parable has a crisis and then a resolution. Each parable, something is lost and then is found. And we see this intensification. So in the sheep, there is one thing out of 100 that was lost. And in the second parable, there is one coin out of 10 that was lost. 1% to 10%. In the parable of the prodigal son, there's one brother, one son out of two that was lost. There's an intensification. And when something is found, there's a celebration, but the party gets bigger with each parable. In the parable of the lost sheep, there's simply joy. 
In the parable of the lost coin, there's joy before angels. In the parable of the prodigal sons, there's a detailed celebration with a fattened calf. And all this, friends, is to show you that the Father's heart bursts with love and joy for you. And it tells us that whenever a sinner actually commits his life to Jesus, that heaven explodes with fireworks because it celebrates the recovery and the restoration of a sinner who now has become in Jesus Christ a son. That is what the parable shows us. So how do we become a son? When I was five years old, I think five years old, I was living in Louisiana, and I don't remember any of the details except this. I remember I was angry at my mom, and I remember standing by the front door, and she was up on the stairs, and I remember as a kid, I was probably selfish, throwing a tantrum. I remember I was really angry with her, and because I was angry, I said something to the effect, I remember, I'm going to run away from home, and I did, actually. So I walked out the door, looked back to see if anyone was coming after me. No one did. So I walked out to the door, walked a couple of blocks. I don't know the details. I was only five. And I remember I was just by myself back then. And I just sat on the curb and I was just like playing with the leaves, got a stick and tried to make fire with the leaf. And I just played around as a kid. And all of a sudden, there's this guy on a 10-speed bicycle, zooms past me. And I looked up and it was my older brother. He came out to find me because he was worried about me because I was his younger brother. In this parable... The older brother was supposed to go out and get the younger brother, but he stayed home to follow the rules of the house. But friends, the reason that we can become saved, the reason that we can be accepted in the kingdom of God, the reason that we could call God our father and be called a son is because the true elder brother, Jesus Christ, did what the older brother in the parable couldn't do. Jesus Christ just didn't go out to a foreign land to recover the younger brother. Jesus Christ came from heaven down to earth, and then he died upon the cross to save people like you and me. He took sinners, and he took our sin upon his back so that now in Jesus we can be adopted as a son, that now in Jesus we could be clothed in the righteousness of Christ, that now in Jesus we can enter into the presence of God with the quarrels of the angels and to sing worship to our heavenly Father, and finally we could get a sense of what Cherry Sapphire says, I sense the pleasure of God because in Jesus, he has made me his very own. So, so friends, I want to end on this one practical note. I pray that if you're licentious or self-righteous, that you'll turn back to the Father and find your ultimate place and hope in him. And I pray that this church, as we continue to evangelize and think about this, that this parable will convict you and motivate you to say that people within the various spheres of your lives who don't know Jesus, if they become saved and accept Christ, heaven is going to explode in celebration. And don't you want to celebrate? Don't you want to party with God? You want the best party ever? Can't go to downtown L.A. Can't go to New York, Manhattan. You evangelize and bring a sinner into God's house, and there will be a celebration for you that you can never imagine. There will be a party that we could participate in that you can never even begin to taste. Let us turn to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you so much. We thank you that you sent your son, our older brother Jesus Christ, to come and save us. We pray that you would help us to see for those of us who have lived carnal lives and made mistakes and have sins, that we would turn to you and receive forgiveness. We pray for those of us who are critical and self-righteous, judgmental, and are like the older son, that we would be humbled and also receive forgiveness in Jesus. Help us to know that your heart overflows the love and mercy for us, that we may find our place in your house.